Hello, I'm Angus McCann and I'm Chair of the Edinburgh Integration Joint Board. I'm really pleased to have this opportunity to talk to you about the Edinburgh IGB and its role in supporting wellbeing, addressing health inequalities and delivering health and social care services in the City of Edinburgh. These are vital public services which the IGB plans and oversees. We've developed this session so that we can tell people more about the IGB, but more importantly to hear people's own views about how our ambitions should be shaped in the coming years to deliver the best support and outcomes for the people we serve. Of course, when we started to plan these sessions, we hoped to be meeting face to face, but the world has changed so dramatically. We anticipate though that this online meeting will still prove to be very valuable for all of us. For many, many years, it's been recognized that health and social care services are not adequately well joined together. People have spent too much time coordinating different parts of the system to meet their needs and telling their stories over and over again. Scotland is not alone in having such issues. Indeed, the country is actually recognised as a leader globally in trying to address this challenge. And in 2014, Parliament passed legislation to bring aspects of the health and social care systems closer together. The result of this across most of the country is the creation of integration joint boards, IJBs. These organise and manage the performance of many aspects of healthcare as well as all adult social care across a local authority area. IGBs are independent public bodies, although they call heavily upon services through a partnership called the Health and Social Care Partnership, which is between the local authority, here the City of Edinburgh Council, and the NHS, in our case NHS Lothian. So the IGB determines what is needed and then directs either the Council or the NHS Board to deliver it through the Health and Social Care Partnership. Our services are very wide ranging and include, amongst others, residential care, care at home, adult social work, district nursing, general practice and some hospital based services such as the emergency department and geriatric medicine. We are responsible for mental health services and support for adults with a learning disability which span inpatient care as well as services in the community. The IGB seeks to join these services more closely together to meet the needs of an individual. Our board comprises a fantastic mix of people and experience. We have 10 voting members five elected city councillors and five NHS non-executive directors who are appointed through a public appointments process, all ensuring that we are democratically accountable. Our non-voting members include representatives from the medical, nursing and social work professions, unions, carers, third sector, and we're all here to bring different perspectives and advice in order to reach decisions on providing the best care that we can with the resources that we have available to us. Health and care is important to every one of us. We might go for long periods in our lives without giving it a great deal of thought, but ultimately we all rely upon the availability and quality of these services like no others. Over the course of a year, the IJB will discuss what services are needed where. It will consider what we can afford and how to spread the resources that we have. And it will look at how to evolve services to meet changing needs. At different times, we will cover our budgets, our workforce, quality of our services and also wider issues such as climate change. Sometimes these discussions are really difficult. We know that there are people in the city who don't receive the support that they would want or that we would ideally want for them. We also know that we don't have the resources to provide all that we'd like to and so we need to strike a balance. However, we do also know that health and care services aren't structured as well as they could be to address the needs of society in the 21st century and I'll talk a little bit more about our transformation plans in a moment. Despite the difficulties, despite the fact that I and my board colleagues worry every day about the well-being of Edinburgh citizens, this is a really worthwhile endeavour to be part of. Sometimes it's frustrating too. We'd like to make change faster, but we are making steady change and evolving, in improving our services, and I and other board members are committed to progressing this evolution. We all know that Edinburgh is a great city to live in. It's home to a little over half a million of us, and the population here is expected to grow by a further 13% in the next decade. That's five times the rate of population increase in the country overall. Moreover, the number of our elderly residents will increase considerably more. For example, projections show the number of over 75s in the city increasing by some 75% between now and 2043, and that's about six times faster than the increase in our population generally. Now, why is that important? Well, Quite simply, the older population generally have greater need to call upon the health service and social care than younger people. So when that part of our society is growing quickly, then so will the need to provide more services. The need for care is also impacted by levels of poverty. 
and whilst Edinburgh has many affluent areas, it also has parts where over a quarter of residents are classed as being in poverty. Our work therefore includes elements that aim to promote well-being and to prevent illness, especially that caused by societal inequalities. The type of care that we need has also changed markedly over time. We now suffer from conditions that often stem from lifestyles that are less active than those experienced by previous generations. It's also the case that we've learned to manage these conditions that once would have resulted in an early death, but that of course means that we need to deliver more care to more people for much longer periods. Infectious diseases are less common now, although as we've seen this year, they've certainly not disappeared. COVID-19 has presented our organisations with huge challenges and will do so through the coming winter. And more than just challenges, it has presented great uncertainty, meaning that our teams have to respond very quickly to a changing situation and that what we can offer may need to change in the short term. COVID has, however, also prompted much thought on how we can change in the longer term, with one visible area being in the use of digital services. Technology isn't the answer to every health problem, but it is now possible to consult with a doctor by video or to measure your blood pressure easily at home, for example, and this can make medical help more accessible than it has been previously. Every day in Edinburgh, over 5,000 staff go about the business of the IJB, and I want to thank them for their hard work in normal times and their remarkable efforts over the pandemic period. Our staff really are fantastic. They do difficult, stressful work to allow us and our families to live as rich lives as we can at times when we aren't in peak health. I could highlight many examples, but to give just two, week in, week out, our carers provide care to over 5,000 citizens in their own homes. And other colleagues provide hospital at home treatments to almost 1,000 patients every year, keeping those pay people at home and out of hospital. Let me say a few words about how the Edinburgh IJB is developing services for the future. We know that we can't address the needs of the growing population that I spoke of with the increasingly constrained budgets that we have available to us. But simply trying to trim services to meet those budgets will only lead to people receiving inadequate provision. We therefore have a strategic programme underway that will run over several years to change the way we do things. The key parts of our programme are called Three Conversations, Home First and the Edinburgh Pact. Three Conversations involves listening to people's views of what they need, linking them to appropriate services for the short or long term as appropriate, and doing so more quickly than has been the case in the past. Sometimes people just need a little help to get back on their feet, sometimes considerably more care, but this approach aims to agree the level of support with an individual or their family. We're already seeing encouraging results from this radical approach. For example, in our innovation sites, average waiting times are reduced from 40 days to less than four for a citizen to have a proper conversation about how we can provide support. We believe when we roll this out across the city, we'll transform how people can access the support and advice that they might need. A hospital might be the right place to be when you're unwell, but when you're on the mend, you'll get better more quickly in a more homely setting. And Home First describes our approach to helping people be at home or in a homely setting for as long as possible. If you are in hospital, our Home First navigators work to help plan for discharge and organise services within your community to continue the recovery journey. We're also finding new and innovative ways to avoid going into hospital in the first place, supporting people to remain safely at home through the use of a variety of community-based supports. Again, this is at an early stage, but feedback from our staff and from those we support has been very positive. The third element of our strategy is the Edinburgh Pact, and you'll hear a little bit more about this in a few minutes. But essentially, we're developing a new and clear agreement between the health and care system and the citizens of Edinburgh. All this work is driven by our transformation team to help us change the way we provide services as soon as we can. The approaches are new and different. They require us to change our mindset. But we know that people want more integrated services and that unless they're seriously unwell, they'll be happier in a more homely setting than a hospital. As we change our services, we want to have a continuing conversation with Edinburgh citizens, hearing your views and telling you what we're doing. And this event is one part of that process, but it can't be the only part, so we will have other ways of communicating throughout the year. You can find out more about our work through the website and Twitter feed. We're also looking for people to join the IGB as lay members. If you use health and care services or are a carer and this interests you, then please get in touch. We, we really welcome the chance to hear a breadth of perspectives. Now let me start to summarise so we can hear from some of my colleagues and some Edinburgh citizens. The IGB exists to improve the provision of health and social care within the city. 
Our transformation plans will run over the coming years to create a system that is effective for those who need to call upon it and efficiently uses the resources that we have available to deliver it. At present, we do have a significant degree of uncertainty caused by the pandemic, but you can be certain of the commitment of the Edinburgh IGB in trying to address the challenges that we face. My name is Dr Linda Irvin Fitzpatrick and I'm going to speak today about the development of the Edinburgh Health and Social Care Pact. This is about the partnership developing a relationship with the citizens of Edinburgh. Now we could have sat in a room and developed a pact or a promise but we wanted to do this through a process of co-production, of dialogue and of conversation beginning with the question, what does health mean to you? What does care mean to you? We began this work in June in the midst of the pandemic and the lockdown. We therefore needed to respect social distance and regulations and conduct our conversations in the digital space. So what did we do? We conducted a public survey where we asked a series of questions online for people to respond to. I interviewed 23 city leaders from the third sector, from the IGB, from Health and Social Care Partnership, elected members, city council members and academia. We held focus groups with frontline staff and practitioners. We joined and took our conversation to the voluntary sector forums across Edinburgh, which were established by EVOC. And we arranged meetings with different community groups. And we worked with our partners, Media Education, to do photo voice, asking people to take a photo of what health means to them. And you can see the 100 plus images that people submitted to us representing what health meant to them. You can see these on the Picture and Health website or at the concourse in Waverley Station where we um, have been able to exhibit the, the photographs. So what did people say health meant to them? People talked of how health was not just the absence of illness but rather a state of mind that you're conscious of. They spoke of being healthy as having the freedom and independence to do what you want to do, of, of to live how you want to live. People spoke about the need and importance for balance in their life, of having regular routines, and people spoke about physical and mental health, not separating physical and mental health out, as so often we do, but thinking holistically about their complete health needs. We asked, what does care mean to you? Here, people talked about the necessary, the necessary support that you, may, that you may need should you become unwell, or if you are unwell. They spoke of how any care needs to be delivered with compassion, respect and dignity. And the importance of being remembered and heard as a person, not just as a set of symptoms or needs, but someone with likes and dislikes, an identity other than the one being cared for. What did all this conversation tell us? There was great consistency across the different strands of work and very clear six themes emerged. I'm going to talk briefly about each one and share some of the comments and remarks that people made. The first theme was around a shared purpose, the importance that we have a common goal, that we are all collectively trying to do the same thing, that we're trying to lift people up and create more equality across our city. People talked about how they wanted to try and get in there early and be preventative rather than reactive. Our second theme was around relationships. People talked of being inquiring, of being curious, of having a shared humanity, of being compassionate with one, on, one another. People talked a lot about um, the impact of COVID-19 and that making them rethink what's important to them in terms of their own relationships. People talked often of dual roles, of being a staff member and a citizen, of being cared for and receiving care. One participant said, I think that the understanding of what every citizen brings with them in terms of hinterland and story, fostering a sense of curiosity about that and consciousness about that is really important. Our third theme was around community mobilisation. I think during COVID-19, we've all been amazed 
by our communities and by how we've started to maybe speak to our neighbours for the first time or knock on a neighbour's door to ask them if they need anything or join a local Facebook community group. How can we continue to mobilise our communities? How can we make sure, as one participant put it, that more people have good, more good days and they do more of the things that they want to do? How can we build on what we've learned? Our next theme is the theme of radical transformation. We have heard from colleagues earlier about our ambitious transformation programme across the partnership and we want to go further. We want radical transformation and there's a real appetite for going further. We want to take concepts such as the 20 minute neighbourhood, the concept of community we wealth, the wellbeing economy and really begin to enact these across Edinburgh. One person said, how do you bring people together to make something happen? How do you create possibilities out of nothing? Rather than say, we haven't got the money, it's gonna get worse. That is sucking the life out of everything. We need to think that we can and do make change. Our next theme was around agility. Agility in relation to the workforce. So how do we ensure we create an, uh, a workforce that can thrive, that is enabling, that has autonomy, that is focused on people's strengths? How do we ensure that our governance is agile, that we have um, accountability to citizens, that we have reduced bureaucracy and that we can respond nimbly in a crisis? And how do we have an agile leadership? that is intersectorial, that represents leadership comes from all levels and all um, sectors, that's adaptive, that trusts people, that is a no blame culture and it facilitates us being a learning city. One person said, it's not failure just because everything doesn't work. It's not failure because sometimes things do get worse. I don't think there are failures but they might be reasons for us to continually challenge ourselves and learn. Our last theme was measuring and evidence and change. So how do we ensure that we are continuing to listen to people, to the things that they say are important, and importantly, how do we then demonstrate that impact? So as one person said, so we have to stop asking to account for how many, how big and how much, and start accounting for what happened, what changed, and why was it good? So, these are our six themes. And what do we have in order to make and help this, make this happen? As you've heard mention, we have big strategic change programme. We have three conversations. We have Home First, we have the work around One Edinburgh, the work around Thrive Edinburgh, our developing workforce strategy, our focus on digital inclusion and our bed-based review. And looking forward, we have uh, the opportunity to renew our strategic plan informed by the Edinburgh Pact. We have data-driven innovation. So what is data telling us? How can we use that to better understand how our citizens are using health services, social care services, third sector services? How can we bring alive the concept of the 20-minute neighbourhood? How can we learn from our primary care colleagues who are transforming the way that primary care is, de is, is delivered and how can we ensure that we truly do take this opportunity to mobilise our communities and what's really important is the dialogue continues. The Edinburgh Pact dialogue is alive. We want to hear from more people. We are very much aware that we need to reach further into our BAME communities. We need to reach further to our faith communities. We need to ensure that we accept the open invite to attend EVOC Third Sector Forums, that we listen to the lessons learned from the Poverty Commission and we consider how we are going to respond and enact the aspirations of the Poverty Commission. We need to keep talking to our frontline staff and how do we translate that Edinburgh Pact into what does it mean for me as a staff member? And we need further to reach out to more citizens, to those who maybe don't join forums or groups. How do we reach other people so that everyone can become involved in this conversation? I would really, really welcome ideas on that and for ways um, that we could engage further 
with all those restrictions that we have in place. I would really welcome your thoughts, so please um, do get in touch and I'm really looking forward to working with you all.